For countless years, people have used silver and gold as their primary currency. And over those years, some of it was lost, stashed, or otherwise taken and hidden from history. These are the stories of America's buried treasures in your neck of the woods. Today's treasure tale takes us to San Francisco County, California. For a little history about a lot of treasure. This story comes from the book, Tales and Treasures of California's Missions, by Randall A. Reinstead. When Padre Francisco Palu founded Mission San Francisco de Aces, little did he know he was planting the seed of one of the world's most charming and beautiful cities. Most historians place this historic event in late June 1776 just a few days before the July 4th adoption of the Declaration of Independence in far-off Philadelphia marked the birth of the United States. Some San Franciscans like to trace the history of their city back even further, all the way back to 1595. It was in that year, almost two centuries before the mission was established, that the name San Francisco was first connected with the area around the Golden Gate. Fittingly, for a region that is rich in shipwreck lore, the story involves the wreck of the Spanish Galleon. The ill-fated vessel was commanded by, by a valiant Portuguese sailor named Sebastian Rodriguez Sermano. Sermano had probably earned his command during an earlier adventure on the high seas before his voyage to Northern California, he had been the pilot of another Spanish ship that fought and lost a deadly Pacific duel with a craft sailing under an English flag. After relieving the badly burned galleon of its rich cargo, the victorious English put the crew ashore on a remote section of Baja California coast and sailed away. Despite being stranded, the Spanish were not about to give up. With the help of their pilot, Shimano, they succeeded in sailing their crippled craft to Acapulco. Perhaps as a reward for his part in bringing the damaged vessel back home, the Portuguese seafarer was made captain of one of his own galleons, the San Agustin. Unfortunately for Shimano, not to mention his crew and the backers of his voyage, it was this ship that would meet a tragic end off the Northern California shore. Most sources agree that the mishap occurred in an inlet known today as Drake's Bay, located approximately 30 miles north of the Golden Gate. The bay is named after Francis Drake, a daring English sea captain famous for attacking and robbing Spanish ships and settlements. Although some disagree, many people believe that Drake stopped at the bay in 1579 to recondition his ship during his famous around the world voyage of 1577 to 1580. 16 years after Drake's visit is supposed to have taken place. Sermano and his crew of the San Augustine were exploring the area and mapping the coastline when disaster struck. A fierce Pacific storm blew in and disabled the galleon against the rocks. The vessel, together with the load of treasure it had carried, all the way from Manila in the Far East, was soon lost. Fortunately, most of the crew were ashore when the storm hit, and they had nearly finished building a small sailing craft to use in exploring the coastal inlets. The second vessel, described by some as a launch, was not designed for ocean travel. However, his galleon wrecked, Sermano had no choice but to complete the smaller boat in hope that it could carry him and his men back to Mexico. Leaving their oriental treasures scattered along the beach and in the depths of the bay, Sermano and his crew crowded into the boat and resumed their voyage down the California coast. Packed in tight quarters and lashed by wind and waves, the survivors had a miserable time of it. According to one source, the lack of food only made things worse until they came along a big fish that had become stranded on the rocks. Whatever this catch was, it must have been a mighty big fish because the entire 70-man crew was able to live on it for a week. 
Despite the hardships, Servano continued his original task of mapping the rugged shore, charting sections of the coast more accurately than anyone had before. Most important, he also succeeded in bringing the men to Mexico safety. Sadly, his achievements won him little praise. Instead, he was blamed for losing the galleon and its valuable cargo. What makes this episode significant for the story of, of San Francisco is that the unlucky captain apparently left something besides abandoned treasure at the site of the shipwreck. Before departing from Mexico, he bestowed on the inlet the name of the bay or port of San Francisco, thus establishing the name that the region bears today. In the decades following Sarbano's voyage, a number of vessels made their way along the Northern California coast. Looking back, history buffs are amazed that for nearly 175 years after Sermano took his leave, the beautiful harbor we know as San Francisco Bay remained undetected. Although the bay's entry, known today as the Golden Gate, is narrow, you would think that some sharp-eyed seafarer would have spotted it eventually, but the bay remained a secret only known to the local Indians until it was discovered in, by the Spanish in 1769 by land. The discovery was made members of the Portola expedition while they were seeking the elusive Bay of Monterey. Usually the honor of this momentous find is given to Sergeant Jose Francisco de Ortega. It was this unexpected happening that eventually led to the founding of the Mission San Francisco de Aces. Incidentally, there is an interesting antidote about how San Francisco's first church got its name. According to the story, when Padre Sierra learned that the trio of missions that were to begin in Alta California chain did not include one name of honor, Sir Francis, the founder of his order. He questioned the Vestidador General Don Jose de Galvez about the matter. Supposedly, Galvez answered in jest, if St. Francis desires a mission, let him cause his port to be discovered. While this tale may be more fiction than fact, I must admit that if St. Francis did have anything to do with the founding of the mission, he certainly chose beautiful area to lend his name to, while we're on the subject of names. I should mention that Mission San Francisco de Aces is popularly known as Mission Dolores. Apparently, the site chosen for the mission was near a small stream the Spanish called Arroyo de los Dolores, Shallow Creek, named after the Lady of the Sorrows. Soon, a nearby lake or lagoon was also being called Dolores, Laguna de los Dolores and in time, the name was extended to the church as well. Even though the lake and the stream were filled in long ago, the name Mission Dolores persists to this day. Another place name always comes to mind when the subject of San Francisco comes up. It is, of course, the Golden Gate. When you hear this name, you probably think of the spectacular bridge that links the San Francisco Peninsula to Northern California. However, history buffs are quick to point out that the American explorer, John Charles Fremont, claimed to have named the entrance to San Francisco Bay in 1846, more than 90 years before the world-renowned Golden Gate Bridge was completed. The name soon took on added meaning as tens of thousands of fortune hunters passed through this gate on their way to the Sierra Nevadas during the California Gold Rush. When the cry of gold echoed around the world, the village that had grown up near Mission San Francisco was changed forever. Just prior to the gold rush, the entire population of the town, approximately 820 residents, would have fit comfortably in a modern day school gym. The settlement boasted a pair of hotels, a couple of wharves, a newspaper, and about 200 houses. When news of gold for the taken reached the Bayside village, for a time, it resembled a ghost town, as the locals joined the mad rush to the gold fields. It didn't stay that way for long, though. By 1849, tens of thousands of rowdy gold seekers were finding their way to Northern California, 
as both a Pacific gateway and a supply point. San Francisco ballooned from a small seaside settlement to an entire city of tents, shacks, and ramshackle buildings. By the end of 1849, its population swelled to an estimated 20,000 people within a dozen years. The gateway to the gold fields claimed to be the 20th largest city in the land. The wild and woolly days of the gold rush were not kind to Mission St. Dolores. Despite being some distance from the center of town, the aging church was not safe from the activities taking place there. Before long, the neighborhood around the Padres' house of prayer became noted for gambling, horse racing, saloon life, and other unchurchable going-ons. The constant stream of fortune hunters pouring into San Francisco guaranteed that the rough and ready times would continue for quite a while before things settled down. The town's port became the destination of ships for many lands. Often, a cheer would rise from the decks of an incoming vessel as it cleared the Golden Gate after its long voyage. The name alone was considered good luck, and to navigate the channel safely was even better. Gold fever seized sailors as much as everyone else, and many a multi-mast ship was abandoned by our crew after dropping anchor in San Francisco Bay. Often, the ship's cargoes rotted in their holds because no one could be found to unload the freight. With the dazzling vision of riches dancing in their eyes, able-bodied men had little thought for any task but hunting, digging, and panning for gold in the Sierra Nevada. So ready were the crews to leave their ships behind that at one time, some 500 vessels were stranded in the bay instead of putting out to sea. Many of these abandoned craft became part of the booming town. They were used as warehouses, hotels, lodging houses, restaurants, saloons, a jail, and according to one source, even an insane asylum. Some of these gold rush vessels are still very much a part of San Francisco, though an invisible one. They were absorbed into the landfill on which new buildings were constructed as the town expanded. Today, the bones of the ships lie between the streets and skyscrapers off the city's downtown financial district. The subject of ship bones brings to mind the many stories or mishaps at sea that are associated with the area around Mission San Francisco. One account of a vessel that was lost near the entrance of San Francisco Bay lends even more meaning to the name Golden Gate. The ship in question is known to treasure buffs as the city of Chester. The Chester burned and sank in 1888 following a collision with the steamship Oceanic in Pacific waters about three miles outside the Golden Gate. As with many shipwrecks, Tales of sunken treasure began to circulate after the Chester went down. To this day, the stories refuse to die. Perhaps because of several accounts indicating that the Chester took 30 million in gold with her when she plunged to the bottom of the sea. Coincidentally, another well-known shipwreck also involved a vessel that was named after a city, known to many as the Queen of China Seas, the famous steamer was officially named the Bay of Rio de Janeiro, and its loss in 1901 was one of the worst maritime disasters in California history. The accident occurred on February 22nd at about 5.40 in the morning, as the Pacific Mail Steamship Company vessel attempted to enter San Francisco Bay through a dense fog, with visibility reduced by the fog and the pre-dawn darkness, an error in judgment brought the sleep ship too close to the channel's south shore. Suddenly, the crew and passengers heard the sickening sound of a shuttered grinding crash, and the tragic last minutes of the Rio began to unfold. Confusion and panic set in. Those aboard the Rio tried to scramble to safety. Sadly, less than 20 minutes after the vessel struck the submerged rocks, all activity aboard the stricken steamer came to an abrupt end 
and the gallant ship slipped beneath the sea. Most accounts agree that there were more than 300 people aboard the Rio when she ran afoul of the rocks, but that fewer than 100 of them lived to talk about it, and talk they did. In fact, for many years afterwards, the survivors met on the anniversary of the tragedy to share their memories and count their blessings. In all, between 120 and 130 people perished when the Rio went down. Also lost, of course, with the steamer's rich cargo inbound from Hong Kong at the time of the wreck. The vessel was carrying a load of goods from the Orient that included such things as silk, hemp, sugar, tea, rice, opium, and tin. In addition to these goods, rumor has it that the Rio boasted a bonanza in silver, gold, jewelry, and other valuables. To this day, the treasure bus and diving enthusiasts continue to discuss and search for the lost ship and the riches that are said to have accompanied it to the ocean bottom. And who can blame them? Accounts tell a silver bullion aboard the vessel worth anywhere from 250000 to an exaggerated $6 million. The rusting bulk of the Rio is also said to contain $75,000 in gold bullion and jewelry worth more than 37000 Adding to the ship's lure is the question of what was in nearly 200 bags of mail she was transporting, not to mention the hundreds of registered packages that were stored in her locked room during the fateful voyage from Hong Kong. Although no one knows for sure how much treasure the Queen of the China Seas was carrying, estimates of its value range from less than 500,000 all the way up to 11 million. Even if the amounts have become exaggerated over the years, it's little wonder that the wreck of the Rio is a favorite topic of discussion amongst divers and fans of sunken treasure. Another reason for the continued interest in the lost steamer, at least among treasure buffs, is that the Rio is said to have sunk close to shore. Some accounts state that the site of the wreck was in the vicinity of Fort Point, at a location that today is almost directly under the Golden Gate Bridge. With this in mind, you would think one ship's remains would be relatively easy to locate, but despite a handful of reported finds, to date, no one has proven a claim of finding either Rio or her cargo. When the Spanish selected a site near San Francisco Bay for their sixth mission outpost, they guaranteed that tales of shipwrecks and lost treasure will become part of the lore of the future settlement. But not all of San Francisco's treasure tales concern the treacherous waters around the Golden Gate. In fact, a number of other bonanzas are said to be buried closer to the downtown area than the mission itself. Approximately enough, one such cache was hidden and lost in the heart of the area that became the city's financial district. This episode had its beginning when two women arrived in San Francisco in 1850. Like many newcomers, the ladies were temporarily sheltered in a tent, frightened by the many unruly characters who frequented in the neighborhood. They became concerned about the safety of their valuables, monks their belongings, were Mexican doubloons, gold nuggets, precious jewels, and deeds to large land holdings in Southern California. To keep these items safe, they decided to bury them near their tent until they found a more secure place to live. After finding more permanent accommodations in another part of the city, the two women took some time to settle in before returning to their original quarters to retrieve their fortune. Much to their dismay, when they did go back to where their tent had been, they found stacks of stones piled on the site and a lot of construction going on. Their pleas to move the piles of rock fell on deaf ears, and before long, a large building rose on the very spot where the treasure lay, concealed. There the cache remained buried under tons of concrete for 76 years. 
1926, it was announced that a structure that had covered the woman's fortune would be demolished. When the building came down, a son of one of the women was on hand to reclaim the long lost wealth. Unfortunately, when he searched the site, he found nothing at all. Perhaps as the son believed, he was beaten to the treasure by the steam shovel, scooping up the earth beneath the buildings and the valuables were dumped into a truck along with the dirt and hauled away. As I wandered the streets of San Francisco today, I can't help but wonder how many other treasures might be here, might have been built upon over the years. Most of them, of course, would have been buried by people, but it may come as a surprise that Mother Nature also had a hand in spreading the wealth. As a matter of fact, while many early San Franciscans rushed off to the Sierra Nevada in their quest for gold, they might have had a bit of luck if they had looked for the yellow metal in their own backyards. Tales of gold being found in the city's famous hills began circulating as early as the 1850s. And at least five locations of reported gold strikes are within easy walking distance of the mission. The largest being about three miles away. Unfortunately, it wouldn't do any good for me to tell you where these sites are for today. They are all covered by buildings, pavement, and streets. Another treasure tale that is especially fitting for this chapter involves both a shipwreck and a church treasure associated with Mission Dolores. This story also introduces one of the picturesque islands of San Francisco Bay. The tale begins about the time the Mexican government took control of the California missions in 1830s. During this time, the Padres and many of the coastal churches took precautions to keep their, their valuables from falling into the wrong hands. According to local legend, the father of the Mission Dolores decided to place the church treasure in large chests and load them aboard a ship bound for Spain. Unfortunately, the vessel never reached its destination. In fact, it never made it out of San Francisco Bay. Instead, the sloop headed for the Golden Gate. A storm came up and dashed it against the north coast of, of Yerba Buena Island now the midway point for San Francisco, Oklahoma Bay Area. Luckily, the chests were recovered from the wreck. Supposedly, they were then buried on the island where they remain to this day. The church treasure, by the way, isn't the only horror of valuables that is said to have been stashed on Yerba Bueno Island. According to another tale, some years after the mission church was buried, an American whaling vessel made a stop at San Francisco on its way to the North Pacific. Unlike most whalers, this vessel was carrying a treasure. One, it had acquired in a most unusual way. The ship's previous port of call had been Caleo, Peru. When it anchored in the harbor, a revolution broke out. In the midst of the unrest, a small group of wealthy Peruvians approached the captain and pleaded with him to store their valuables aboard his vessel for safekeeping. Thinking the revolution would soon be over, the captain agreed. Unfortunately for the rich Peruvians, when it came time for the ship to leave, the uprising was still in progress. Unable to wait any longer, the captain sailed out of the harbor with the wealth still on board. Different sources give different viewpoints concerning the captain's intentions. Some say he planned to return the treasure on his next trip to Peru while others indicate he planned to keep the valuables for himself. Whatever the captain's plans were, he was wise enough to know that whaling and treasure don't mix. So when the ship put out at San Francisco, he decided to bank the wealth in a safe place before heading for the Arctic. Along with selected members of his crew, he loaded the valuables onto a small boat and rowed them to Yerba Bueno Island shore. From there, the men took the treasure inland and buried it. Soon afterwards, the whaler took leave of San Francisco. This should be the end of the story as the vessel was never heard from again. However, 
even though we may be able to write the end to the captain and most of his crew, the treasure tale isn't quite finished yet. According to one source, a member of the crew jumped ship before it sailed out of the Golden Gate. This sailor was one of the shipmasters who had helped to bury the Bonanza, and it was he who later told the story of the treasure stash. At this point, you might think that you could write the end to the treasure too, as it would seem that the sailor would simply have uncovered the valuables and enjoyed the whatever pleasures they could buy. Apparently, however, this was not the case. It seemed that the men who took part in hiding the hoard were all hands to swear a terrible oath of secrecy, being a man of honor, not to mention afraid of what would become of him if he broke his word. The man kept the secret of the treasure location until the day he died. So if we could believe this account, perhaps the wealth of several Peruvian families still hidden on the Yerba Bueno Island. Incidentally, 1939, the Golden Gate International Exposition, the second of San Francisco's World Fairs, opened on a man-made island that adjoined Yerba Bueno. During the construction of the asylum, countless tons of dirt and rock were transported to the site. With this in mind, some have speculated that perhaps the treasures that were on the Yerba Bueno got mixed in with Phil. If so, maybe there are more to the name of the artificial tale that most people realize, for it's called by one and all, Treasure Island. In closing this chapter on Mission Dolores, I'd like to mention some treasure of another kind. Ones that can be found by anyone who cares to visit the historic mission, grounds. These treasures are not gold or silver or precious jewels, but common stone. To many, they may seem to be worth little, but to history buffs like me, they are priceless. For they help us to relive the fabulous history of the city that grew up around the Spanish mission. The treasures I am thinking of are the grave markers that dot the mission cemetery. To stroll through the small garden, reading the inscriptions on markers, is to walk back in time in the silence of the graveyard. We can acquaint ourselves with some of the people who helped build one of America's favorite cities. There are names that we remember from history books such as Don Luis Antonio Arguello, one of California's early governors. And there are names that perhaps no one remembers. There are winners and losers, young and old, rich and poor, famous and infamous. There are native Californians resting along those who were native to the lands far across the sea. Maybe it is this mixture of people that helps to make this final resting place so special, like San Francisco itself. The Mission Graveyard is home to individuals of many kinds, colors, nationalities, and places of origin, all brought together by the tides of history to the beautiful city by the bay. Please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Hit that notification button to follow me on YouTube. Thanks for stopping in. Hope you enjoyed. Good luck. Happy hunting. Keep on taking it. For even more to explore.